All hands on deck and a little bit of a lesson here at Quaddy North in Barrel 42 in the beautiful Applegate Valley. When I stopped by, winemakers Herb Quaddy and Nicole Schulte took me through the process of all things bubbles. Here I learned Quaddy's story with sparkling actually started in 2014. That's when Herb decided to make a sparkling rosé of Cabernet Franc. Then and now, it's the only wine like it in the United States. And I kind of just declared, okay, we're, you know, we're making sparkling wine. It's good if you want to learn how to do something to try to practice on yourself, right? And so, you know, it's our own wine. If we make mistakes, so be it. Okay. It was pointed out to me. You're like, they're like, wait, sparkling rosé of Cabernet Franc, nobody does that. And then I looked around and I said, yeah, I don't think anybody is doing this. I haven't found anybody making sparkling rosé of Cap Franc. Herb Quaddy, owner of Quaddy North and Custom Crush Facility Barrel 42, says since then, he and his team have learned a lot. My yeast plugs were too big. Uh, which means that I had too much yeast in the bottle, which just contributed to some nice bready and yeasty flavors, which, you know, people really liked. It, uh, it was a small production lot and we offered it to the Quaddy North uh, uh, customer base and it became kind of a cult favorite and now it sells out every time we make it. Winemaker Nicole Schulte says while yes, it started as an experiment, creating a sparkling wine program was something she wanted to do in an effort to offer Barrel 42's clients something no one else could bring to the table. So I thought, hey, if we invested in some sparkling wine equipment, some of our clients had already asked us to do that, then we could, you know, we could uh, pay off the equipment and get uh, Southern Oregon some bubbles. We realized that there, this service didn't exist in Southern Oregon. And so Southern Oregon couldn't really develop a sparkling wine reputation or programs if somebody didn't go and do this. So we thought, well, you know, why not us? We have Grenache Blanc sparkling, we have a Cabernet Franc sparkling, we've got traditional sparkling wines which are made from Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Really, we kind of run the gamut from uh, mm -hmm. pet nats to method traditional. There okay. are several different methods to achieving carbonation in the bottle, right? And one of the interesting methods that we also do is the pet nat method, what they call method ancestral. That's the original way of making a sparkling wine. In that case, you basically crush your grapes, press, you have fresh juice, you fer ferment it for a while, and then bottle it. So you finish the bottle, the fermentation in the bottle. And then you get a little bit of, you get some sparkle, and then you could disgorge it or not disgorge it, right? That's the primary fermentation in the bottle. Method Champenoise is you make the wine, you put it in the barrel, you age it for some period of time, filter it, and then restart the fermentation. So you add sugar, you add yeast, you have to get that fermentation nice and, nice and happy, and then very quickly, you know, you have to bottle it. So you need to bottle it with really, really precise timing. Otherwise, if it's too much yeast or too much sugar, the bottles will explode, not enough, and it'll be flat. These wines were made method champenoise, and this was disgorging day. And usually our, our wines stay entourage for about 24 months. Entourage refers to this second fermentation. After the yeast and sugar are added, it's the period of time where the bottles sit on their side for several months or years. So after some time, when the wine is aged in those cages, they are riddled or turned slowly upside down so that they're on their necks. You can see in there that the yeast has collected on the crown cap. That's called the plug. That plug has to come out, but it's not as easy as popping the top. At any moment, one of these bottles could explode. Schulte says she's seen it happen. Each one of these bottles is under 90 PSI of pressure. So if you think about your car tire, your car tire is about 30 to 35 PSI. This is 90 PSI in every bottle. So we have to be super careful working around these. The bottles, still upside down, then go into a solution that's negative 22.7 degrees Celsius. See, it's frozen that plug right there. Is that? Yeah. So the next big thing we can do is pop that plug out and it's going to, we call disgorge, or the, the pressures in the bottle is going to push all the yeast out. So what we're left is a clean, with a clean sparkling wine. Then it's time to get dressed. A cork, a cage, a label, some Sorry. foil, and then it's boxed and ready for the client. Schulte says don't let this organized assembly line fool you. Starting a bubbles program can be a huge undertaking. You have to have your numbers right or else the bottles are going to explode. So remember when I said each bottle has 90 PSI of pressure? Well, the math that goes into calculating how that happens is kind of inundating. And if anything goes wrong anywhere in the process, then you have lost something that it takes years to make. 
So there's a lot of time investment. There's a lot of technical knowledge. There's this, the space to store the wine uh, on tirage, which ages for up to, we have wines now aging over four years, up to five years. So all of that takes a lot of commitment and patience and time and space. This is the fun part right here. It's, it's, it's more fun when it's hard. This regular still winemaking, I mean, it is really rewarding. We can make a very, very nice wine, especially if you planted the vineyard and grew the grapes. But I mean, uh, to some extent, the wine is largely made in the vineyard and, and in the winery we're custodians of it. Uh, sparkling wine is a very active winemaking process. I mean, we are really, um, it takes a lot of focus. You have to do a lot of the steps correctly. Um, of course, it takes investment in, in machines and it, it's just very, very, it's fun. It's the rewarding part for sure. While the equipment helps push the process along, these two winemakers say it's also passion and hard work pushed in a bottle and a nod to a method that came hundreds of years before them. The challenge is to just keep improving. I mean, and to keep challenging yourself. And um, we got into winemaking because we enjoy the making of wine, right? And we have to, things like this actually help, I think, continue to rekindle that, you know? And so give yourself a challenge and also realize, of course, where you are in the pantheon of winemaking and know that experts uh, in Champagne have been doing this for a long time and do this really well. And we just try to aspire to that, you know, to, to learn a little bit, to be able to have a program here in Southern Oregon that would be fun and enjoyable.